This is Fred Beck from Fred Talks Fighting. Today, I'm very lucky to be joined by Peter Buckley. So thank you very much for coming on, Peter. It's good to see you. Thanks, Lawrence. So what's been going on with you, Peter? What have you been up to? Me? Hey, um, just been working that stuff, I've just been chilling, you know, nothing much. So you, you've been, you retired from being a journeyman back in 2008. We'll get onto that in a bit, but what have you spent your time doing since then? Me? Hey, um, I've got four grandsons, so... I spend a lot of time with them, do you know what I mean? I take up a lot of my time and work as well. So day after day, I'm just relaxing, just chilling. Oh, what do you do as a job? Me, I do uh, removals, like, oh, yeah. you know, office removals and all that. Oh, yeah, that sounds all right. So we'll, yeah, go back. so we'll go back to when it all started. So what I found quite interesting is, as an amateur, you were, you made it to the schoolboy national finals. So it means you were quite a decent amateur. What can you remember about your amateur career? Yeah, I was a very good amateur. Um, I boxed for a club when I first started called Talbot. Started when I was 10, had my first fight at 11. Won my first fight, lost my second. Won my next 19 fights on the trot. Got to the schoolboy semi-finals, lost to Nigel Maitland from Liverpool, who was a top pro later on in life. Um, and then I was I got to the uh, junior quarterfinals of the junior ABAs. Failed the way at the way in there, so I was out of that. And then I went to the NABCs and uh, I won the Midlands, got won the beat the Wales champion, the Liverpool champion, got to the uh, NABC finals where I lost to Mark Tibbs, Jimmy Tibbs, son who used to train Dylan White and that, you know, so he was a good kid. And then I packed it in, I packed in boxing when I was 15. And why was it eventually you kind of stopped, you went off boxing for a while when you were 15? Was it because you kind of get into trouble a bit with the police? That's exactly what it was, yeah. And, I was in a detention centres and youth custody centres for a few years till I was 20 years of age. And then um, I got back out and met a fellow pro and uh, he just took me to the gym and I just started trying again. Got the bug for it within three months. I was, had my first fight after five years, which I got a draw with, but I thought I won the fight, but I'll give it a draw. And when you turned pro, when you eventually did turn pro after all the amateur stuff, did you kind of have, did you kind of have aspirations of winning the English title, British title, or did you kind of want just want to be a journeyman fighting every every few weeks? No, I was, I was never in a journeyman when I first started. Look, so I had ambition, but I was just doing boxing really just to keep me out of trouble, keep me on the straight and narrow for a bit. But I was boxing some good kids and I was beating them. And I, my first twenty odd fights, I won like thirteen out of the twenty, a couple of draws, and I was doing okay. It's only like I injured my shoulder in a middle of the title fight, and um. From there, just I was just like surviving, just taking fights at short notice, and you know, a couple of hours notice, an hour's notice, and going to fight all these top amateurs, former amateurs, and European champions, like. Right? And most of the time, I'm lucky if I had a week's notice. You know what I mean? Like I say, the shortest notice I had was probably two hours. Well, so you're eating a dinner, and they call you. Your manager calls to say you got a fight. Exactly, that's happened on more than one occasion. You I know, mean, I've been sitting in the house and I had a phone call. I'm on my way to pick you up. I'll just say, oh, am I fighting or how many rounds, how much money, blah, blah. Straight away, I'd say, yeah. And I never, I never ever turned the fight down, you say. Well, you know him once, you never said, what if you were ill or something? Had a I cold. When I was a, a cold, yeah, a cold boy. No, I boxed when I had the flu and all that as well. And, you know, it was just, it was hard, don't get me wrong, against some good kids. I mean, I boxed Paul Ingle twice, but the second time I boxed him, I had the flu and for three rounds, it was really hard to fight. I thought he was going to stop me, but I gritted my teeth and, I got through eight rounds, so you know. Blimey, eight rounds, and you had the flu. That's quite, that's quite a stretch. And what I found quite interesting is you do three hundred fights as a journeyman, but you only got stopped ten times. What's about you? What, what was it about your style that made you kind of hard to hit or hard to get chinned? Well, I was, um, I was very calm when I boxed. I never panicked, and that, and uh, I could read a fighter. Good. The better the fighter I boxed, the better I boxed actually, because when you're fighting a, a top fighter. It's easier to read the shots because you know the class. It's when you're fighting the novice who isn't as good as that and they can hit you with silly punches that you wouldn't normally get. With. But with a, a, a good world class fighter, European fighter, British champion fighter, you know they're going to be skillful. So you, you can read the shots more than someone who, who's not as, as skilled as silly as it sounds. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I can understand. I mean, it's always awkward fighters, which are some of the most tricky fighters. And so speaking of sharing the ring, you shared the ring of. Well, quite a few world champions I found out on BoxRec. You shared with him, yeah. I've got the list here, Kel Brook, Lee Selby, Selby Prince Nassim Hamid twice, Barry Jones, and lots of other world champions. Who do you think gave you a toughest test in the ring? 
Oh, Duke McKenzie, without a doubt. You know what I mean? Look, I'm in the box, Duke McKenzie. I wasn't a journeyman. I went down there, as stupid as it sounds, to, to beat him. But then I found him out levels in boxing and he was a completely different level to anyone I'd ever fought. And he stopped me in five rounds. But I wasn't overwhelmed in the fight. I was doing okay. And I boxed him a second time. But I took I boxed him a second time and I had a bad shoulder. I didn't set the fight thinking I could win. I took the fight for basically for money that time. And, you know, but um, Jim McKenzie, without a doubt, free weight world champion, class person, in the ring and out of the ring, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's quite cool to, to say you shared the ring with all these people. And what was it like being in the ring of Prince Nassim Hamid? Twice as well. Well, look, say I did, when I was offered the fight, I'd saw Naz anyway. I knew Naz because he used to come around the shows a lot. Before he turned pro, Brendan Ingle. Got on with him, cheeky little, you know, get, but he was a nice enough kid, really. And uh, when I was offered the fight, I didn't, I jumped to it. And he, I knew what to expect. I knew he was going to come out, trying to bomb me out, but it was never going to happen. I, I weren't going to let him do it. And um, as much as it sounds, he, he didn't sh shake me once, buzz me once or nothing. And then when I was offered the second fight against him, people thought I was going to turn it down. I was like, well, I'm going to turn it down. I've already boxed him once, no problem. And I boxed him. And if you watch the fight on YouTube, he should never have been stopped. It was a bullshit stoppage. Yeah, I understand. There was a bit, was a bit of an odd stoppage. So, yeah. when you when you got when you're a journeyman, you get to about two hundred fights. Is the aim? What's the aim to get to three hundred fights? No, yeah. never. Someone would have said to me when I first started boxing, you'll have three hundred fights. I would, I would have thought it was crazy. But after I had a hundred fights, because I, you know, I felt I still felt fresh and okay. And a um, hundred fight, I actually boxed a, a former British champion at a day's notice in Scotland. I boxed him before. Lost on points with Mike Devane, no problem. And then I had 200 fights. It was only when I got to about, as most say, 250 fights. I started started feeling a little bit wear and tear more than I was getting hit with shots a little bit more. And actually, when I had 292 fights, I actually packed it in, believe it or not. A lot of people don't believe that, but I, I, I said I wasn't fighting again. And then I went to a show in Scotland. My friend was boxing. I was on the top table as a guest. And um, Tommy Gilmore, the promoter in Scotland, said to me, you should have had eight more fights, make it 300. And he was the one who really, in a way, put it into my head without knowing. And I thought, hmm, good idea. I'll have eight more fights. And I literally had eight fights in, say, eight, nine weeks. And my last fight was in my home city in Birmingham, which I won. And I retired, like, on a good note. All my medicals, all my brain scans had just been done and that. It was all clear. So it was a good way to retire and on the win as well. And I knew it was time to finish anyway, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's quite nice to win in the win on your last fight against Martin Mohammed. Obviously, yeah. you crazy during it, Sim, and you got the win, the last yeah. win. Um, would, and eventually, oh yeah, on your last fight, I think Ring Magazine, Boxing News, I think they all wrote about it. What was that like? Because they're quite well known in the boxing world. Oh yeah, it was. It was, it was, it was big news around the world. Was, like um, someone sent me the Washington Post. I was actually in the Washington Post as well. I was, like, you know, and uh, it, I was having phone calls from Germany. Australia, you know, into, you know, reporters won't speak to me. And it was a bit over. My last fight was a it was a bit, it was worse. And my first fight, I was more nervous in my last fight than my first job was, was getting that so much media attention and that I wasn't used to it. And it was a bit overwhelming. Like was, I mean, on the morning of my fight, I even trained because the, the press wanted to feel, now I think about it, I thought, why have I done that? I don't know. Any light work out, but I never, you know, I thought, why have I done that? But it was a bit overwhelming and like Look, like saying the first round, well, I thought I was really tense, and I loosened up. It was only four rounder, and I loosened up then and got the win. The win was, you know, it was a, I knew I was going to beat the kids, you know what I mean? Yeah, it must, it must have feel a bit like opposite ends almost. You almost feel like a bit like a prospect going as a debut, you know, it's your last fight. Um, yeah, just one question Would you ever recommend being a journeyman to anyone else? Yeah, because you can earn a good, not everyone can be a champion, you say. There's only, you've got to be really, really good to. Only the elite can make money in boxing, like your Ricky Adams, your Nassim Ahmed, your Mayweathers. Not every world champion boxer ends up being rich. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you've got more TV coverage now and all that and sponsorship and all that. But um, it's, it's an odd way to make a living, but you can make a living out of being a journeyman. But would I recommend it? You've got to be thick skinned. And you've got to be, you've got, people used to say I was tough. I was clever. I knew my way. I knew when to tuck up, when to hold them, when to. You don't fight for three minutes of every round, you see. He's on that. You burn out really quick. So you look, you pick these tricks up, like everything in life. You, you know, it's like when you're a builder, you learn little things. You, you get a better builder as you become, you know, years down the line. Or become a better journeyman down the line because you learn tricks and referees know you and they know what you can take. And 
I was never really, I've never really took a, a beating in, in the boxing ring, I can honestly say. Yeah, I can imagine. I've always thought that journeymen know, they know how to ride the shots well. We know how to mm. kind of clinch, when to clinch, when not to. And yeah. I always thought that journeymen, they always have the best stories. And you just got a book out. I think it's probably, I think it's out tomorrow or might be out now. Well, the time into is out. Yeah. What gave you the idea to do this book? Well, what it was, Mark Turley done a book called The Journeyman, right? And he got in touch with me about, and he, he said to me, I'm doing a book about The Journeyman. It was quite a lot of The Journeyman. I know him. I've took Matt Searight, people like that, Jason Nesby. I took them into fights when I still had my trailer's licence. And Mark Turley phoned me up and he said to me, oh, I'm doing this book, Journeyman. Are you interested? And I was like, no. He, I think I took it back a bit. And he was like, you know, I was like, no, I'm not interested, right? So a few weeks down the line or a few months, he phoned me up again. He's gone. I've got one chapter left and I want you to do it. I was like, no. And I said, why do I want to do a book with you? I've got enough stories to my own book. And he like triggers a spark in me. He thought, well, people want it. I might as well do it for myself. Why do it for someone else to claim the glory? I've got my own stories. What could for, what I could write 10 books about? Really, I've done one book, but someone said to me, funny enough, is all your 300 fights in this book? And I was like, that'd be stupid. You'd have to be in the encyclopedia, do you know what I mean? But um, it's not a bad book, yeah. It's quite good. Yeah, for those who want to buy it, I'll put the link in the description. It's called um, yeah. King of the Journeyman, The Life of Peter Buckley. Is that right, Peter? Yeah. Thanks so much for the interview, mate. I really appreciate it. So thank you, mate. Cheers. Nice one. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.